to, if you need it, uh, just please select the button in the of a globe in the right hand side of the Zoom screen. So today it's a great day. It's an honor for us uh, to welcome you to the first Philanthropy for Climate open house meeting. We have here today it's representatives from the international and national philanthropy commitment signatories, philanthropic organizations that are willing to become signatories, national associations of foundations, networks of foundations, and many other types of organizations. And we are all committed to the same thing, to take urgent action on climate change. We are also here because we believe that philanthropic organizations have an immense potential for positive climate impact when integrating climate considerations into their work. The challenge for us here is thus much more about how than about what. We are all part of this movement called Philanthropy for Climate that as of today counts with 529 signatories. Reaching this number was a tremendous collective achievement. We are here now to show that you are not alone in this journey, that we are here to learn from each other, and we are here because collaboration is a very powerful tool for effective and strategic climate action. We have three objectives for this event. First, to foster a sense of community between the national and international signatories, and that you all gather a better understanding of what are the different pieces of this global philanthropy for climate movement. Second, to give you all a space for exchange with each other, to share your own experience in this climate journey and to inspire others to move ahead. And third, to introduce you to the International Philanthropy Commitment Implementation Guide that is officially launched today. So as you can see in the screen, this is the agenda for today. After this very brief uh, welcome remarks, we will have a quick check-in, followed by the contribution of our two wonderful keynote speakers. Then we will hear from Philea, the National Climate Commitment hosts, and from WINT. We will have then a peer exchange moment and we close with a quick presentation of the implementation guide. So before we proceed, some very quick housekeeping reminders. The first one is that please, if you can add your name and organization, rename yourself in the Zoom. For those that want to stay the whole event in Spanish or Italian, we kindly ask you to add in front of your name, the code IT, or SP that will show uh, the image right away. So we can allocate you to the correct breakout room. In the chat, there will be an example on how to do it. The plenary sessions like this one of the meeting will be recorded in English and we will share afterwards. And feel free to send questions and comments and participate in the chat as we go. To start this journey, we would like to ask you a few questions to know who is here today. We will use Mentimeter and Caroline Gardner from Philea will share the link in the chat. Let me check here. Yes, thank you very much, Caroline. So, can you see it uh, now? The first question is, in which country are you based? Yeah. Nice, you see people coming, actually people are coming in in the chat. I don't know if people are also coming in with the Mentimeter. Uh, Caroline can show us. Yeah, wow. Wonderful, well, as you can see a lot of places, nice. Yeah, that's what a global movement should look like. We're always striving for more diversity, but we already have a good base of countries here. Cool. 
Great. So let's go to the second question, please, Carolyn. The question is, which is your primary thematic area of work? We know that we have different organizations working on education, on health, on climate. So let's take a look at this as we go. I can't see Carolyn. I don't know if you can share it again in the big screen. It would be nice for us to see. Wow. Well, yeah, interesting to see. We have already a lot of climate people in the group, and I would be curious to know what the other is exactly, but well, we have that time for that later on. Lots of disadvantaged groups. Um, no, no one on education. Interesting. Uh, well, maybe there wasn't an option there. <laughs> Something to put it in the next slide. So, yeah, but we see that we also have a diverse uh, starting points, let's say. So let's move to the third question. So the question is, in which kind of organization do you work? Are you a foundation, a philanthropy support organization, an academic institution or other? Great, thanks, Carolyn. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, as you can see, the majority of answers so far are from a foundation or philanthropic organization, which is precisely the primary audience of our movement and why we are here. We wanted to know the other types as well, because we do know that uh, these other kinds of organizations are very important to make all of this happen. So. Interesting, great. So the last one, um, and you can give, just put one word, uh, is what is the key learning that you can share with your peers in this journey, in your experience with climate so far? It could be one word. Complexity, cooperation, urgency. Perfect. I like this. Keep discussing. There is no one way. Yeah, that's precisely the spirit as well. Collaboration, cooperation. Yes, yes. These are all characteristics, I would say, of our movement. Wonderful. Good. Yeah, we will share with you all uh, in the end. I think it's a good uh, way to get to know a little bit the, our own global vision, but we will share with you the full results along with the recordings in the end. So now that we have this big picture of who is here, I think it's a time for a quick check-in. We will send you to small groups and you have five minutes to get to know each other. Uh, we do propose one question, a simple question as icebreaker, but please feel free to uh, talk about whatever you want. But the question is, why did you feel encouraged to join this meeting today? Hello, I think welcome to everyone that has joined us a little bit later. I think everybody is coming back from the breakout rooms for the quick check-in. So for now, we just had like our brief introduction, but uh, now it's the more substantive part of the meeting happens. Just for yeah, those that joined later on and haven't done so, if you require uh, to be in the Spanish or Italian breakout rooms later in the meeting, please add IT or SP at the beginning of your name, before your name, so we can allocate you properly. Great. Natalia, are we all here? Are we all back? Great. So 
Let's go to the next uh, session of our meeting today, where we're going to hear from our two inspiring leaders in the climate justice field, Yamid Dagnet and Elisabeth Vatucci. Yamid is the new climate justice director at the Open Society Foundation. She is, was not able to join us, unfortunately, but she sent a short video telling about the Open Society Foundation experience on climate change. So Natalia, if you can put her there. Hello everyone, my name is Yamid Daniet. I am the Climate Justice Program Director of the Open Society Foundation. Let me first thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be with you today virtually and to share our climate journey with you. The Open Society Foundation is about building vibrant, inclusive democracies, holding governments accountable to their citizens. Human rights, justice are not just concepts for us. It's very much our DNA. So why engaging on climate? Well, because climate is a matter of social injustice. Climate is a matter of economic and social security. Climate is a threat to democracy. By destroying climate infrastructures, affecting food production, access to fresh water, habitable ambient temperature and ocean food chains, it displaces people, it exacerbates the risk of conflict. With each degree of warming, health challenges increase, with not only negative impacts on mental health and well being, but also more conflict, especially for the most marginalized populations. It's a tale of injustice because the most vulnerable communities who have contributed the least to the problem are suffering the most and bearing disproportionate impact economic, non-economic losses and damages due to climate change. The result, climate change becomes that crisis multiplier with profound implications for international and national stability. So why are we engaging now? Well, let's face it. The world's response to climate change has been too slow inadequate, uneven, not only in terms of scale of actions and investments, but also in terms of equity, human rights. Have we been in transparent enough? Have we held government accountable, corporate the sectors as well? No, we need more inclusive relation, more inclusive processes. So we know that we have to engage in a very humble way. And we decided over the past two years to test how to connect climate with some of our core issues. And we collected you know, all those projects to make it some sort of initiatives. But it was very time bound, very project oriented. And we decided and we realized actually that it was not that sustainable and not that transformational. So to play a more decisive, a bit risky part, we decided to very much have a more systematic and a more programmatic approach to climate change. So we don't know yet how beneficial it's going to be. We believe that the role of philanthropic organization is to take some risk and to pilot you know, what could be very much the seeds of a sustainable future. So here we go. And we know that all ends are needed on the deck. So we're looking forward to do it with you. In the meantime, our contribution is going to be about fostering just transitions, not only towards low carbon economy, reducing emissions, but also towards resilient societies, equipping vulnerable communities to better adapt and tackle losses and damages incurred by climate change. 
we know that you cannot do that without more sustainable, equitable, and accessible finance. So here we go. Now I'm looking forward to seeing you in that journey. To see you soon. Excellent. Well, thanks, Yamid, for sending that very inspirational video. I think the words of transformation and just transition are particularly remarkable and are also part of the motto of our next keynote speaker, which is here with us. Uh, and I would like to very much welcome Elisabeth Fatucci. Uh, Elisabeth is a Kenyan environment and climate activist and founder of the Green Generation uh, Initiative. Elizabeth, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. My name is Elizabeth Watuti, and I am a climate activist from Kenya. And thank you once again for inviting me to speak today. You're probably expecting me to talk about the climate emergency and how urgently we all need to act but I'm going to assume that you know all that. But instead, today I want to talk about trust. Three weeks ago, I received a heartbreaking call for help from a community in Laikipia County in central Kenya. For countless generations, this farming community has lived from rain-fed agriculture, but now the fourth season in a row, the rains are failing them. So like over 2.5 million fellow Kenyans, they and their children are now facing starvation. And you might be wondering why they called me, a 26 year old climate activist with no access to serious resources. It's because they feel abandoned by all of the leaders and institutions they have turned to for help and they no longer know who to trust. I wasn't sure how I would be able to help them. So I decided to go there and listen to them. They entrusted me with their hardships. They told me about the never ending drought, about the patched land, about the crops that lack enough water to grow, about the great distances that they have to walk in order to drink water. They told me about the escalating human wildlife conflict as both humans and elephants compete for food and water. They entrusted me with their hope and they hope for a borehole and water harvesting system that can meet their modest needs. They hope for beehives to enhance their nutrition and keep the elephants away. They hope for fencing to protect a micro -irrigated, irrigated market garden. And they also hope to cultivate a commercial fruit tree nursery to feed themselves and even make a basic living. It may not sound like much, but realizing these hopes could be the difference between life and death. This community entrusted me with their hardships and their hope. They feel that no one is listening to them and that, res and that the responsibility that, that is there right now weighs so heavily on me. So for the last six years, I have been leading the Green Generation Initiative, which I founded to nurture a generation of environmentally conscious individuals who love nature. We provide environmental education to children across Kenya and improve their food security by establishing food forests in their school grounds. And so far, we have planted over 30,000 trees and grown them to maturity. Because of this, I was able to gift the community in Laikipia County some fruit trees. But as a small grassroots organization, that is all I had to give. They asked me to advocate for them. So I promised that I would carry their story with me and share it with people and share it with also people like you who might be able to help. I understand that many of your organizations are just starting the journey into the world of climate change philanthropy. So I urge you to listen deeply and to place your trust in these frontline communities. They have the wisdom and vision to know what they need. So often we see big organizations developing their own climate change strategies taking months to work out their theory of change and even determining their funding priorities. Meanwhile, so many communities and children are on the brink of starvation and they struggle to access basic life-saving resources because we don't trust them to know what they need. Please trust them to know what they need. Supporting community-based adaptation is vital. 
but the climate crisis is now so advanced that many changes will defy adaptation. And the more we go on emitting, the more severe these changes will become. This is the fear that my generation and the children I work with are facing every other day, that the droughts, the floods, the collapsing ecosystems will outspace our capacity for adaptation. So what then? That is why so many of the young people I know have turned to climate activism. We have realized that every day our grassroots initiatives are being undermined by decisions being made elsewhere and our lives are also at stake. So we are taking our fears and our hopes to the international stage. But we too are struggling to access the basic support that we need. Often we find ourselves sharing a platform with heads of states government ministers and CEOs. But what you don't see is the abundance of institutional support behind each one of them. A speech writer, a communications director, a policy advisor, a secretary, a logistics team, and a generous budget to ensure that they are well rested and well fed. But behind most youth activists, you will find no one, constantly having to beg event organizers to cover basic travel costs managing Gmail accounts that are exploding with speaking and interview requests, and approaches from organizations that also want to capitalize on our social media influence. All of these on top of the crushing fear of our future and in many cases, our personal safety. When we seek more sustainable support for our activism, the barriers seem insurmountable. We do not have legally registered entities or boards or even business bank accounts. We do not have the required institutional policies or long documents setting out on our strategies. And once again, it can seem like a lack of trust. So please trust us. We did not go into climate activism for personal gain. We do not have the capacity or resources to set up legally registered entities, and in particular in countries where that process is highly politicized. We need support to ensure that the voice of our generation and the voices of frontline communities are heard around the decision making tables. I have entrusted you with our hardships, and now I will trust you with my hopes. I hope that what I have shared with you today will stay with you. And I also hope that you understand the urgency and I hope that you will proceed with trust. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for your very powerful words. I think we all really got it deep in our hearts and I think we are all here committed to do something. This is a community for action, not for talking only. And I hope you will see that uh, listening to each of the national commitment hosts and from wings, which will be our next moment in the agenda today. We will, we will understand more how we got here. What is this collaboration, this trust-based relationship that several organizations have been building and how we are gonna grow and develop this movement further. To move us, to the next session, I would like to invite Max von Abertrott from Philea. Max, please, the Thank floor you. is yours. Thank you very much, Alice. And it's great to see you all, um, the signatories of the commitment um, that is still a very young initiative and uh, at the beginning of its journey. Um, it's great to have you here. What we will do now in the next uh, 15 minutes or so um, is uh, to give you a bit of a flavor of where this movement actually comes from and how it has been in, evolved and grown over the last um, months. Um, so sharing with you the journey towards meaningful climate action across the philanthropy sector is really um, at the heart of this. Um, as we all know, it's a collective action. It's not one single person or one single organization who did that. Um, it is literally all of us and many, many more out there who couldn't join today. Um, following a bit this mantra or this idea of if we don't act today, how can we be sure we can act tomorrow? And that is a, a clear call for urgent action. 
So we will um, now enter into a um, small um, sharing of, uh, of backgrounds and, and um, yeah, back information about how the initiative started from, from different angles um, across the world. And I invite you um, maybe just to, to listen to this uh, with a lens and uh, find out how this movement and all its, in all its diversity relates to you. If you feel like noting something down, please do. If you want to share something in the chat, feel free to do that as well. And I would like to invite first uh, Joanna Pienkowska from ACF, the Association of Charity Foundations in the UK, uh, to share your part of the journey. Thanks so much, Max. And thank you to Wings for bringing us all together today. Um, hi everyone, my name is Joanna and I live on the UK's Funder Commitment on Climate Change at the Association of Charitable Foundations, which is the membership body for UK foundation grant making bodies. Um, so it's really great to be here with you all today to see so many people representing philanthropy around the world and its growing commitment to climate action. And I also want to say hi to those of you who are UK signatories. Um, it's nice to see your faces. Um, so others later on, I'm sure we'll touch on where we are in the movement now and how this has evolved and grown, uh, but I can bring it back to its origins and beginnings as the UK Fund the Commitment was the first of its kind to launch. Um, so the UK Fund the Commitment emerged from a group of ACF members who are some of them likely in the room with us today. Nick Perks, who you'll be hearing from later about the new implementation guide was key at this part of the story. Um, so the group of foundations were concerned about climate change and felt they wanted to do something significant in response to the threat that the Elizabeth spoke to, but they were unsure where to start. And as non-environmental funders, not yet active in the climate space, some of them felt confused by the volume of information available on the topic of climate change and others felt overwhelmed by the scale of the challenge they were facing. Yet they realized, as I'm sure all of you here today do, that climate change poses a risk to all of the funders' charitable aims and it's not exclusively an environmental issue. So the causes, effects and solution of climate change all intersect with so many other areas of civil society that all funders have a unique responsibility to act in the space that they're in, build on the expertise that they have and encourage action in their specific area. Um, the UK Fund the Commitment was publicly launched in the autumn of 2019 at ACF's annual conference. And the theme of that conference was actually climate change. Um, our chief executive, Carol Mack, at that conference, uh, this isn't a direct quote because I don't have it, but she said to our members that climate crisis is real, it's serious, and all foundations should take uh, intentional action in their response with all of their assets. Otherwise, we all risk finding ourselves on the wrong side of history. So when it launched in 2019, we had an initial 14 UK foundations making their commitment to climate change uh, action public um, and inviting other funders to join the pledge too. Since its launch, as of last week, I believe, we have now 90 UK charitable foundations from across the nation signed, signaling their intent to act on climate. Um, we've got small family foundations, large corporate foundations, community foundations, and everything in between. Um, we'll soon be publishing our second annual reports on the progress that these signatories are making against the areas of the funder commitment, um, which I thought this might be a good moment to advertise, so do keep an eye out for that. Um, and I look forward to hearing about how the other national associations are taking on their funder commitments. Thanks, Max. Um, thank you very much, Joanna. And let me build on that now from the European perspective with my filia head, um, because uh, the initiative taken uh, by ACF at the time uh, led to conversations at European level, how we could help to leverage and scale up um, this movement, which was a very small seed at the time, um, to really make it accessible uh, to a wide range of foundations, ideally across the world. And that was also the moment when WINGS came in and we started conversations about um, how to build something that brings all these initiatives together that we can see today. And um, it is about um, overcoming the barriers that um, some foundations have seen 
in entering or applying climate action or, or, or taking up climate action um, in their own field, because many of those who have um, signed are not climate foundations. Climate is a completely new topic to them. And the idea of applying a climate lens to everything that the foundation is doing is at the core of the commitment. So from that end, we started developing the international philanthropy commitment on climate change and, um, and made it available. And it was from the outset, a global initiative. Beside that, we also invited national associations um, from the filiere perspective across Europe, from the wings perspective at global level uh, to set up their own national commitments um, along the lines of the international commitment, which serves a bit as an inspirational standard um, for, for the commitments. The idea was really to complement um, the different approaches and to make sure that we are all part of one movement. Key question which came up from the very beginning is the accountability. So we wanted to avoid that the commitment is used for greenwashing. So that is something that we always are still discussing today, um, how to implement this with the transparency approach in the international commitment and some national commitments this is um, given. Also, this framing helped us actually to build relationships with partners that are strategically important to achieve the goal, um, like the EU institutions, like the World Resource Institute, and many, many others. So that's why this movement from the UK through other national associations to the European and global level really helped us to, to move the needle and encouraged, as we heard before, far over 500 foundations to sign up and to join this movement altogether. And here, um, I'd like to hand over to Beatrice de Montlot um, to tell us a bit from the French story. Beatrice is working for CFF and um, looking forward to hear from you. Hello, everybody. I am so pleased to be in the middle of all of you and discovering uh, signatories from the whole world and uh, many different kinds of countries. As you can hear, I am purely French living in Paris and uh, I joined the French Center of Foundations in November 2020 to launching the French Commitment and the French Coalition for Climate. So it is really a pleasure to, to be working on that. And uh, as I mean, following the example given by SCF and of course by European organizations such as Philia, uh, we issued the French commitments and uh, we now have 128 signatories. So part of the whole group. And of course, we, we would dream of having more. And uh, what we did is uh, trying, like ACF again, to uh, ask them what they put in place. And this is why we issued the first uh, report regarding, I mean, progress report regarding what foundations have done. And I put the link in the chat if you, because you won't believe it. We have a French, uh, a French version, but also an English version. And sorry for Italian and Spanish. <laughs> we will try next time. Um, and the what we we saw in that report is that uh, the good thing is um, one third of our signatories were already able to report actions because, of course, some others just signed the week before or the month before. So uh, we will get more next time. And uh, one of the the main conclusion is that uh, the corporate foundations are, let's say, if we can say, in advance compared to some others because they are embedded in the CSR strategy of the company or the group they belong to. But others, I mean, we have very good examples of foundations that put in place already all the pillars of the commitments. And uh, I was also asked to explain to you some specific characteristics of the national commitment in France. And you won't believe it again, but it is written in French. And we also have available an English translating. Uh, but ahead of that, uh, the main principle of our commitment, like the international one, is to be based on 
actions and to integrate environmental criteria in all activities done by the foundations. So, of course, if you have other questions and you want some details, you can, I mean, link to me. I would be very pleased to discuss with all of you. Thanks. Beatrice, uh, fantastic uh, for sharing these insights. And I'd like to hand over now to Carola Carazzone from Asifero in Italy. Thank you so much, Max. And uh, it's really touching for me to, to be part, to feel part of this community of practice really across the globe. It's uh, thank you so much, Wings, for, uh, for hosting uh, and, and promoting these uh, at, in Italy. Italy is uh, a hotspot for uh, the climate crisis with the glacier melting, with the desertification in many regions, with the impoverishment of the soil, with the, the raising of, uh, of the sea level and uh, humankind uh, jewels like Venice uh, really uh, at risk of, uh, of being covered by, by water uh, in a handful of decades down the road. But at the same time uh, in, in our country, climate does not seem to be the top priority that uh, of course should be um, in the broad public opinion at least in the behavioral changes and in the in the uh, claims that uh, we uh, claim towards the public institutions and for too long climate uh, in, in in Italy has been um, an issue a polarizing issue for um, environmental activist and uh, lefty NGO, so not very much uh, 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 an issue for for many uh, foundation. So in, in November 2019, uh, my team and I proposed uh, climate change as a thematic focus for 2020 to our board. And actually, that proposal was not endorsed. And it was really thanks to the uh, example uh, to the the modeling of uh, uh, ACF, uh, the, Centre, uh, the, the, the 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 National Association in the UK, in in France, and and uh, and in Spain, that we really decided not to give up and to try to try to to uh, uh, to, to to go from another angle and. Um, we were able in September 2021 actually to launch uh, our national commitment with already 60 signatures from uh, Italian foundation in the conjunction with the Climate Solutions Summit that was promoted by F20, um, Foundation 20, uh, the engagement group uh, of foundation vis-a-vis uh, -vis the G20 in Milan. And uh, the number is, uh, is, uh, is uh, still growing. So the two words that I would like to share here is um, um, trying to move the movable middle beyond the so-called environmental funders and really trying to reach out and, 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 uh, and making a compelling case uh, for climate as uh, an issue for everyone. And the other one would be uh, a kind of all of organization approach, uh, like uh, ECFI has been uh, advocating for uh, for a community foundation across Europe. For us, it's very much important that the climate lens are embedded in in the operation, in the endowment management, in the spending side, in all the um, the 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 the, the, um, the, the, the action of uh, foundation and not only uh, with standalone project. And uh, so this would be our remark. Of course, uh, signature is a, a point of arrival and at the same time, a, a starting point. So we are uh, very much in the journey and uh, looking forward to learn from you and to share with all of you. Thank you, Carola, uh, for sharing um, your take on the climate commitment. And it's great to see how it has evolved in Italy. And I'd like to move now to Spain on the map and um, uh, Juan Andres Garcia from AEF, the Spanish Association of Foundations is with us here today. Juan, over to you. Hola, más que gusto verte, gust, que gusto veros. En una reunión como esta, yo creo que lo más importante, para mí lo más importante, por eso hay que dar las gracias a Wins por habernos juntados, es que estemos juntos. Que estemos juntos para, que algo, para hablar de algo, para compartir algo. Yo creo que todo lo que habéis dicho hasta ahora 
eh, Beatriz, Carola, Joana, eh, lo compartimos todos. Es decir, eh, la gravedad, la urgencia, esto es una cosa de todos, de personas, de instituciones, de empresas, y debemos de actuar con, con urgencia y con gravedad. Esto es una cosa muy seria. Eh, os puedo contar un poco la experiencia en España. En España, eh, las palabras clave, porque nos, Max nos ha mandado un correo, yo diría que han sido colaboración, coordinación y liderazgo. Colaboración entre fundaciones en el año 2020, un poquito más tarde que los, que los británicos, eh, en plena pandemia hicimos un documento, un pacto, mm, hicimos nuestro el, el manifiesto de, de filantropía por el clima, el pacto eh, Fundaciones por el Clima, Emergencia Climática y Justicia Social, 45 fundaciones, 45 personas representando 45 fundaciones, trabajamos de forma telemática en la redacción de ese pacto. En el evento Demos de ese mismo año, a finales de año, se presentó en, en, a todas las fundaciones. Estamos tratando de hacer un llamamiento universal, es un llamamiento universal a todas las fundaciones, independientemente de cuáles sean sus objetivos, culturales, de empleo, de investigación, de salud, etc. Todas las fundaciones eh, deben de comprometerse en todos los niveles. Eh, coordinación. Eh, para nosotros ha sido muy importante contar con alguien dentro de la organización, dentro de la asociación, que era Nabelén Sánchez, eh, que, que liderase ese tema, alguien experto en el sector, en fundaciones y alguien experto, experto en cambio climático. Es muy importante que dentro del equipo haya alguien eh, que, que lidere esto. Eh, también dentro de la organización, una organización como la nuestra, que agrupa cerca de 900 fundaciones, es importante que haya fundaciones en cada ámbito de actividad que lideren esta iniciativa. Decía colaboración, coordinación liderazgo. Eh, estamos tratando de que en todos los ámbitos de actividad haya fundaciones que lideren este, esta, este compromiso y también de personas. Y hay que decir que el origen de, de todo en su momento, en un evento como el Demos, fue el llamamiento que hizo en su momento la Fundación Daniela y Nina Caraso en el Demos en el año 2019, en la persona de su directora, que creo que está hoy aquí, Isabel Legaló, a todas las fundaciones españolas. Creo que en esta reunión también está Sonia Mulero, directora de, de, de la Fundación Banco Sabadell. Son dos fundaciones que están liderando esta iniciativa. Hay ocho fundaciones más que están patrocinando, que están apoyando con recursos, pero también con experiencia para que sigamos adelante en el pacto. Hemos hecho hasta ahora sesiones de sensibilización para hablar de todos los temas eh, que, que importan en, en este tema del cambio climático, que son prácticamente todos, desde inversión sostenible al tema de educación, a empleo, a emprendimiento verde, eh, economía circular, es decir, estamos tratando de sensibilizar al sector de la importancia y la gravedad del asunto. No es fácil, yo, yo creo que, que estas palabras que decimos, colaboración, coordinación, liderazgo, hay que añadir una más, y yo creo que todo lo que estamos aquí lo tenemos en parte, que es perseverancia, hay que perseverar. El asunto es muy grave, extremadamente grave, y hay que convencer no solo a las fundaciones que están comprometidas directamente con el cambio climático, sino a todas las fundaciones que están comprometidas, que con, con, presidiendo fines de interés general, que es un asunto que les concierne. Y eh, para eso, pues ahora estamos tratando de desarrollar ese pacto, los siete pilares de ese pacto, tratando de aportar herramientas, recursos, argumentos para que más fundaciones se sumen a esta inicia iniciativa y cumplan con, 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 estos, con estos compromisos eh, que, que tenemos en la, en la declaración del pacto. Actualmente son 172 fundaciones las que ya en España se han sumado a este pacto. Ahora mismo nos está costando más y estamos tratando de que, a, aparte de nosotros, esas 172 fundaciones son prescriptoras del pacto, de la iniciativa. Tratamos de que ellas animen a otras fundaciones a que se suban al carro. Todos los que estamos hoy aquí, que ya veo que somos 90, también debemos de ser pre prescriptores de esta iniciativa porque creo que no insistiremos lo suficiente. Es urgente, urgente, urgente y además es un asunto grave. Entonces lo tenemos que convencer a to en todos los niveles de nuestras organizaciones, desde los equipos de trabajo hasta los órganos de gobierno. Eh, yo aquí termino porque teníamos tres minutos y si sí, termino con dos frases, aparte a mí yo creo que los eslogan vienen bien un poco para transmitir emoción y fuerza. Uno mío es quien más comparte, más gana, compartir, compartir experiencias, conocimiento con otras organizaciones. Y otro que tiene que ver con la Agenda 2030, que es el objetivo 17, las alianzas, eso que decimos tanto pero que cuesta tanto eh, conseguir. Y es eh, de una cita de un, de un futbolista eh, argentino que, que era... Eh, Di Estefano, que dijo que ningún jugador es mejor que todos juntos. Bueno, pues yo digo, nadie es mejor que todos juntos, por eso es muy importante que en esta reunión de WIS nos haya juntado y qué lástima que no nos podamos hacer una foto todos juntos en presencial para que se nos vea. 
porque los gestos en esto también tienen su importancia. Cuando otros nos ven juntos, comprometidos en la lucha contra el cambio climático, dicen, esto es serio, esto es importante. No sé si nos podremos hacer una foto. Y antes de terminar, insistir en el agradecimiento a las fundaciones que están en cada uno de nuestros países, pero en particular en España, están apoyando esta iniciativa. Y aquí, ya digo, a dos personas, no solo a las fundaciones, Fundación Banco Sabadell, Fundación Daniel Inga Caraso, Isabel de Galó y Sonia Mulero, gracias por apoyar esta iniciativa. Eh, nada más, más. Te paso la palabra. Thank you very much, uh, Juan. This is fantastic, uh, this call for uh, collective action and collective impact. Um, I think we are, we are on a good track here. Thanks to all of you. So I'd like to um, hand over now to Ines Chala from the Philanthropic Foundations in Canada to give us some insights from the Canadian approach. Ines, over you, to Max. you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the invitation. I realize that um, we are, um, I guess, with the US, uh, the only <laughs> representatives overseas from uh, North Af America. So very happy to be here. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few things about the Canadian philanthropy commitment on climate change. Um, you might know that Canada is warming twice as fast as the rest of the world. Uh, we're already experiencing the drastic impacts of climate change uh, from wildfires in the West, uh, droughts in the prairies, melting permafrost in the North and storms in the East. Um, the latest data uh, from November, 2021, um, we did a data scan of the philanthropic sector and uh, we realized that only 4% of philanthropic funds in Canada are directed towards uh, the environment and the environment as a whole. We don't know exactly how much is actually um, leading to, to climate action. So I uh, just wanted to highlight that the Canadian commitment is a joint initiative of Philanthropic Foundations of Canada, Community Foundations of Canada, Environment Funders Canada, and the Circle on Philanthropy and Aboriginal Peoples in Canada. So officially, the Climate Pledge launched uh, at our uh, annual conference in November 2021. Uh, we've also launched uh, an accompanying implementation guide uh, that you can see uh, in the chat. I think my colleague is going to share the link. So our aim is really to engage a diverse cross-section of philanthropic actors in Canada to consider and act on climate change um, and their commitment of resources, investments, operations. Um, and we have 45 signatories so far. We're currently processing an additional two. So we are very happy about that. Um, and the uh, support to, um, uh, in terms of capacity building, uh, to, to implement the implementation uh, guide has launched in January of 2022. So one of the specificities of the Canadian commitment is really a clear focus on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, and on the vulnerable that are disproportionately impacted by climate change. Uh, the commitment acknowledges the deep dependence on natural resource extraction and exploitation of indigenous land in Canada. It also acknowledges uh, the intersectionality of root causes of issues. It, it really uh, highlights and affirms the importance of indigenous-led conservation and stewardship. Uh, as you might know, the indigenous peoples comprise 5% of the global population, but they protect 80% of the world's biodiversity, demonstrating the critical climate mitigation and life-sustaining value of indigenous stewardship. So for us, uplifting indigenous-led climate action is pivotal act of respect and a step, a step toward justice. So for, for us, the Canadian commitment also needs and must address systemic barriers to grant making to those closest working on the ground uh, here in Canada. And of course, uh, you probably know that if left unaddressed, uh, the impacts of climate change can undo foundations work to advance equity, health, poverty alleviation, economic prosperity, um, and indigenous and human rights. Um, so this is one of the reasons we have actually established an indige indigenous advisory committee uh, that is uh, extremely uh, important for us. We, for every step of our capacity building program, for any activity that we do with the community of foundations that are signatories um, to the climate uh, pledge, uh, we are involving them in every step of the way. Um, one of our aims uh, until the end of 2022 is really to engage uh, the signatories that are just starting the journey. Um, there are many of them. We do have a few champions um, as signatories of the Climate Pledge, and so um, they are willing to support uh, in, in, in a, the context of peer-to-peer -peer learning, 
um, the other foundations that are just starting. Um, and um, I'm really happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, I'm just keeping it short uh, for the sake of time and really to keep uh, some time for conversation. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ines. What a fire firework, uh, very impressive. As I said in the beginning, this is the beginning of a journey. It's already a great beginning of a journey. And I'd like to hand over to Benjamin um, Belegi now from uh, Winx. He's the executive director there to share with us how we take this journey forward. Benjamin, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Max, and thanks to all our amazing speakers uh, today. Uh, I really want to start by uh, sort of paying tribute to all of the leaders of the networks that are really creating that global movement uh, with such uh, energy, conviction, creativity. Uh, I think it's fantastic. And uh, I mean, we feel humbled that Wings to have a chance to you know, simply help connecting the dots, articulating this as a global movement. And I think it's important that we keep in mind that, uh, to my knowledge, this is the first time ever that the philanthropic sector comes together at the global level and engages into action like this. This has never existed before. So I think we should be aware of the power of this movement, which is, as you said, just starting. I think we have a potential to do much, much more than this. And I can see that the, 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 the pace at which the signatures have been coming, especially when there is a strong leadership uh, by a national uh, network organization, uh, it really shows that there is potential to have more signatories, but beyond that also starting creating uh, a sort of living community that shares their learnings. Uh, and I think the spirit of this commitment is really around learning and starting the journey uh, with, of course, uh, a sense of urgency. And, uh, and there's so much we can learn from each other as, as the climate crisis is a global massive issue that uh, is really relevant um, for all of us. And then there's a lot to be shared between regions, between organizations. Um, and I think that one of the challenges we have to now to address uh, as, as a community, as a movement is, uh, and it was highlighted by uh, different colleagues today, is really how do we convince the non-environmental organizations or those who don't necessarily identify with this topic uh, that this is highly relevant for them and urgent to engage with uh, with really uh, uh, with a lot of uh, of energy and, and with resources. Uh, that's that's a challenge we see, especially um, as Wings is now leading this also outside Europe. Uh, most of the national commitments are in Europe. Uh, we have a great one also we heard uh, in Canada, but uh, across the globe we've been working with our members and and Wings directly trying to get that and. I can see that, in, especially in emerging economies, um, in Latin America, for example, I can still hear the feedback that, all right, yes, climate, yes, it's important. It's good that some international foundations are, you know, working on the Amazon or helping that. Uh, but here in this country, in our local reality, we have all these pressing issues, social issues, poverty, you know, children living in streets, etc. And so, you know, you're asking us to work on environment. And I think that we really need to get rid of this idea that climate is an environmental issue. And we really need to show positively beyond the sort of the general idea that, okay, it's, there's the intersection of causes and it affects everything. But I think it would be great that we can show that concretely when a foundation who is maybe focused on education, on culture, on health, or something else integrates the climate lens uh, in, their, in their work, that they get better results, that they have more impact on their uh, on their own cause. I think that would be extremely powerful. So I hope we can build that knowledge together so that we can convince more to say it's not about you know, shifting your mission or it's not about abandoning what you've been set for. It's about just being even more effective at doing it while at the same time addressing uh, this, this crisis that could uh, simply make all the rest of the philanthropic work uh, completely uh, um, vain. So, so um, I, I won't take much more time. I think we want to hear from, uh, from all of you. Uh, I just want to thank everyone once again. Uh, I think uh, we need your help. We need your help to spread the word. We need your help to reach to new audiences, to learn from your journey, from your failures, from your successes. Uh, and, uh, and also all the networks that are engaged need your continued support so that they can go uh, further and, and um, and so I'll be happy to keep working with you and see how we can take this forward in terms of really showing the impact that engaging has 
uh, and maybe also influencing other actors, governments, etc., and showing what philanthropic actors with their independence uh, and with their uh, ability to take risks, etc., uh, can bring to to uh, to uh, to answer this uh, this massive civilizational challenge. So I'll stop here and, and thank you once again for for all your work. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Thanks you all. Uh, I think it, it's a very clear how diverse and how coherent uh, at the same time is this network of people and how we are all very much willing to go deeper. But we want to learn. We, we need to know how you guys have been doing this work, which kind of difficulties, which kind of uh, actually good experience you already have in implementing your own climate action. So now with all this input, we are moving to our peer exchange moment of the day. And we want you all to share your thoughts and experiences. So the next session, we will divide into groups um, and we will have 15 minutes for this exchange. We have a few questions, guiding questions, but please, once again, this is something built in with many hands. So feel free to address other topics as you like. The three questions we had made for you, we will put in the chat, but just quickly, is that one, what has inspired you to sign the commitment? Two, what are your main expectations and concerns now that you are starting this journey? And three, what is the role of philanthropy support and philanthropy development organizations in expanding this movement and intensifying the climate engagement of foundations? So Natalia will take us there and see you in a minute. Welcome everybody to the plenary. I think, are we all here, Natalia? Or not yet? I'm not yet. Uh, Okay, now I'm sure the conversations, the time was not enough for sure, it never is, but it's a good thing that we want to have other occasions together, so to continue the conversation. So let's wait a few more 30 seconds for everybody to come back and we go to I, the very last. I think we are all here now. Wonderful, welcome back. Everybody, I hope you had a, an insightful and interesting conversation. Uh, at least ours was really good to get a little bit of the understanding of a, a, where each organization is. So we are heading to our last moment of the agenda today. And the goal of this moment is actually to introduce you uh, to the implementation guide that we are launching today. Uh, this is pretty much uh, an initial introduction, as you're going to see, but we are very much available uh, and we'll share our emails and contacts so that you can uh, reach out uh, whenever you like to understand, to raise your questions or, or yeah, try to clarify how would that uh, will unfold and how helpful or how can you use it in your own cases. Uh, I think our, um, the presentation, Natal, the slide is not there. I'm just seeing myself. So I'll give you, while Natalia puts there, I will just uh, give you a bit of uh, background into this. So we actually welcome the Canadian uh, commitment that shared with us uh, their implementation guide that was designed before the international implementation guide. And based on that, we actually had a very much of a participatory process with uh, all organizations that uh, Filea and all the national hosts that you met today um, to input and see how could we make it uh, something that is useful and something that is applicable to different realities of the organizations. So as you can see here, and the whole uh, text is available in the website of the commitment, we have at the International Philanthropy Commitment uh, seven pillars. And for each of those pillars, we have different sets of uh, ideas of actions that would represent, let's say, the initial level one, the getting started level, building momentum and showing leadership. So the whole idea is that uh, with one single document, you can kind of uh, 
embrace the journey and think on where to start and to um, up to where you're gonna uh, would like to get. Uh, the next slide one, we are gonna, not going to cover all the seven pillars here today because we won't have time, but I wanted to give you a little of a, a feeling of two of them. So looking into the pillar one education, you see uh, that there is uh, there are some very simple things that you can do actually. So for instance, inviting the speaker to address your board or organize an introductory workshop with your staff. Go into a very much of in-depth, uh, let's say climate training for grantees, which is something that it's definitely not uh, uh, so easy to do, but it's something that it's, it could be uh, much more, lead your work to a, a bigger impact or, or much more uh, capillarity, let's say, of the message. But all this, uh, I think an important message here is that all these actions, uh, they are not mandatory. They are not necessarily ranked uh, what is more or less important or more or less impactful. They are suggestions so that you can uh, take a look at that and think on how would that be applicable to your own reality. Uh, the next one, Natalia, please is the transparency pillar. So in, you see that there is a difference. Uh, some uh, commitments, national commitments have six or seven pillars. In the case of the international commitment, we are uh, putting a lot of emphasis on transparency because we know, and I think everybody knows how important is the accountability piece, but at the same time, how critical it is to make a, like a transparency framework this could be too much of a burden and actually uh, make that uh, lead some organizations to let's say give up on the, in this journey. The transparency pillar for us, it's very important and it has to be something that is feasible. So all the suggestions uh, that we are uh, providing here, are things like uh, publishing uh, something about the commitment that you have done establish KPIs to measure your own impact or even uh, measure your carbon footprint if you are up to this into a certain level. So the idea here is that uh, we will uh, ask all international signatories annually for reporting. This framework is not uh, developed yet, but we will come back uh, to you soon with that. But it's, it's meant to be something simple, something based on learning, something based on your own assessment on where you are and wh where you're going to get. Um, I think this is, uh, you can take the slides now. This is uh, the implementation guide, as I said, is in the website. We as, at WINGS are hosting uh, several webinars throughout this year to go deeper into each of those pillars. So if you want to talk more about education, let's go deeper into education challenges and, and opportunities and bring the group together. Uh, you, all national commitments, international commitments, it's really meant to be a community of learning, a community of practice. So we're going to go each of those pillars uh, and we are going to also publish uh, a case studies uh, documenting experiences, interesting experiences uh, that foundations have undertaken in each of those pillars uh, at the global and national and international commitments. All of this is also uh, actually heading towards COP27. And this is actually a call to action, a call for ideas, a call for participation, because we are really aiming to have a good and strong presence of philanthropy for climate movement at COP27. This is a very important occasion, even to show that what Elizabeth has told us about the African uh, reality in many places, that we are serious about uh, our commitments and that we are going forward, let's say, on uh, undertaking climate action. So I welcome uh, all ideas that you may have, uh, opportunities we are progressively organizing uh, ourselves to have a more organized, um, let's say, group uh, to discuss COP27, and you are all very welcome to join. We are heading towards the very last minute of the day, and I really would like to thank everybody that was here. Uh, 
all the organiza organizers with me, especially Natalia from uh, my team in Queens, Inez, Joana, Juan, Max, Carolyn, uh, you all know who you are and how important it is to work with you all on this. This is the first moment that we are all together. We are striving to make sure that we have other moments uh, in this process ahead. So do count on us. Thanks very much and have a lovely evening day. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye, thank you. Adiós, muchas gracias a Wins por lo que han hecho hoy. Thank you. Adiós. Bye, thank adiós. You. adiós, gracias. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.